We had 75 applications for a 15 person class, a really small scale class. And we said, whoa, people want to learn this stuff. People want to learn how to code. People want to learn how to become developers. And so we held that first class and it was wildly successful. We had people who were coming in as you know, Subway sandwich makers and then leaving after 12 weeks and going and getting a job at Adobe. And we're like, whoa, <laughs> how did that just happen? In this episode of Establishing Your Empire, we have a fascinating conversation with Tyler and John Richards. If you are interested in finding out how to become the entrepreneur you have always dreamt of, this episode is just for you. John Richards is an award-winning entrepreneurship professor, entrepreneur, venture investor, and mentor. He taught entrepreneurship for over 12 years at Brigham Young University and was named one of the top 25 entrepreneurship professors in the United States. He has also invested in hundreds of ventures and mentored thousands. Early in his career, he created the first ever online Yellow Pages that led to initial public offering and a multi-billion dollar valuation. Tyler Richards was recently named to the Peak 100, a list of the top entrepreneurs in Utah and the surrounding areas. His last three ventures have all resulted in multi-million dollar acquisitions. Tyler has been an active angel investor and has officially entered into the venture capital space with a pre-seed venture fund known as Startup Ignition Ventures. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography, but business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right. I got Tyler and John Richards here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Thanks so much, guys, for joining me. And this is going to be exciting because we have two guests instead of the, the original one. Um, and I want to jump right in because you guys basically kind of work together, right, at Startup Ignition. Like, how did that happen and how does that, how's that going? We're a father-son team that uh, we've done some entrepreneurial ventures together and we angel invest together. And so uh, going back, I'm a longtime entrepreneur angel investor. And then my son, Tyler, actually took some classes I taught at Brigham Young University where he got a degree in entrepreneurship and promptly started a company after graduating. And it was wildly successful and three years into it he sold and had the money to become an angel investor with me we started angel investing and we started also uh startup ignition a boot camp for entrepreneurs also uh around uh the time where he was uh going with his entrepreneurial venture and we started training and teaching other entrepreneurs just like i had done for many years beforehand and so a lot of things he just uh picked up along the way and he likes to uh say that he actually achieved a lot of things at an earlier age than me which is true because he got a little bit of an uplift from being trained all growing up about this stuff being an entrepreneur so he can tell his side of the story, but that's how we're together. And so we've had a fun time. We spend almost every day meeting and talking with other entrepreneurs. Wow. I mean, and any any conflicts with the whole father-son uh, duo or, or does that run pretty smoothly? Sometimes there is because we have strong personalities and sometimes we'll both think we're right on something and that happens every once in a while, but nothing too major and nothing that's too problematic. Yeah, I think it goes both ways. I think we're so comfortable with each other. We say what we want to say and we're pretty forward with one another. But also because of that, we can get over any kind of conflict pretty quickly. Like it's like water under the bridge pretty quickly between us. And it doesn't really get that far anyways. So, yeah, which is going to happen. We, with we think alike, you know, our mentality around entrepreneurship and our you know under understanding around, you know, markets or you know initiatives or missions or theories are pretty aligned because he raised me (laughs) (laughs) he gave me my my first grandchild too so they're right there that's he gets gets so i've earned a lot of respect yeah he's got a lot of street cred from that (laughs) absolutely uh and and how old's your uh your your child tyler 
I actually have three now, but oh, wow. my oldest is the one that he's talking about is seven. So that was the first grandbaby he had. So he, that was exciting. I'm just, I'm new to, new to the game. I have a nine month old. So I, I'm just oh, uh, nice. still just figuring everything out. Right. I'm sure it's the easiest thing you've ever done. <laughs> hardly, hardly impacted your life at all. Not at all. Yeah. Uh, you do realize how much communication matters with your partner and choosing the right partner, how important that oh, is. Yeah. You know, you kind of you kind of thank your lucky stars uh, every night with that one. So Tyler, let's actually talk about that. How, how you became an entrepreneur, because it's kind of interesting, you know, getting training from your dad at school, but also I'm sure there's a lot more to it. Any, any uh, story or uh, experiences that you can share with us? Oh, yeah. I mean, my my entrepreneurial, uh, you know, training started at a very young age just because, you know, my my dad started a, a company back when I was, you know, before I was even born, he was running a company. My dad started his his kind of entrepreneurial career in the Yellow Pages industry. I, I, mean, I don't know if even your listeners even know what that <sighs> industry is nowadays, you know, it's uh, but I remember being six, seven, eight years old and going to his company parties, you know, being around his 80 to 100 employees, you know, understanding what it was like him leading them and seeing, you know, and respecting him and kind of, you know, just being from like a young age, understanding weird business principles, you know, you, as as a, you know, a father yourself and me being a father now, you try to teach your kids and lecture them in the home and, you know, try to you know, raise them the way that you want them to be taught and, you know, understand things about life that you want to show them. And my dad from a very young age was, you know, teaching us the difference between debit cards and credit cards. Like when I was 10 years old, like it, it wasn't like less family lessons about, you know, yeah, we had the family lessons of be kind and be nice and be respectful, but it was also like weird business principles that he was teaching at very young age, because that was the you know, atmosphere that he was operating in. And he, that's the way he kind of raised us too. was just to be entrepreneurial. I knew from a very young age, like, oh, my dad started a business. I want to start a business. I want to do my own thing. I want to sell t-shirts or, you know, make a lemonade stand or, you know, you draw pictures and sell them. Or even back in like the late nineties, early two thousands, like burn a CD and sell it at school, you know, stupid little things like that, just to be entrepreneurial. Uh, that's just how I was raised was, you know, make a dollar and, and, you know, hustle hard and, 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 you know, be your own boss kind of mentality. So, and then how did you actually start your first company? Like walk us through, like, take us back to when that, how that actually happened. Did you go out and find a co-founder or did you have an idea or, or did you just fall into it? How did that happen? You know, I had all this stupid teenage, you know, entrepreneurial quests. You know, I, I was very into art when I was in middle school and high school. And but I quickly realized art really wasn't going to be, you know, a, a very uh, wealth producing industry to be in unless I was like Pablo Picasso or someone like super huge, you know, art, you know, you can't really make it by by being an artist. But, you know, I would take my drawings and I would literally ask my dad for, uh, you know, some seed capital, as you could say, and, or even just mow the lawns and get my allowance and save up for a few, a few months and go and get my, uh, you know, my art drawings slapped onto a t-shirt and sell them in local skate shops. You know, I did those little things all the time. I remember one time standing outside of our local college football stadium and selling, uh, a t-shirt with, uh, the, the college university logo on it, which was totally trademark and patent infringement and totally illegal. But I was standing outside the stadium selling them. And I, I remember making like 400 bucks and I went to my dad. I'm like, I love being an entrepreneur. And he's like, yeah, that was illegal. You can't, do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I was doing stuff like that all the time just to make a quick buck and like, you know, experiment. But, you know, my first true business was not until I was in college, you know, when we were actually making money and, and had customers and users. And um, and that, you know, being dumb, a dumb college kids, my very first uh, startup was actually a dating application. It kind of was the Tinder before Tinder was, um, you know, and it was right when iOS came out, you know, the iPhone came out 2007 and in 2008, 2009, we kind of started playing around with the app store. I've always kind of been in technology because my dad, after the yellow pages transitioned into a dot com company. And so I had always had computers from a really young age. Again, it's super into art playing around on Corel draw and flash. If you remember those programs, Oh yeah, 
you know, I transitioned into the Adobe suite, got into front end development and coding. Uh, and, and I've just always loved computers because I, I, I've been around them since I was six, seven years old. So, yeah. And so, again, in college, I kind of gravitated towards that. I saw, OK, art really not a thing. That was a high school thing. Now I got to get into something that I can build a career off of. And I, I just kind of transitioned from the art world into the tech world just naturally. Well, I think the art background teaches you how to tell a story. And you also it shows you like what's good and what's bad. Which are, yeah. which is huge. If you have good taste and you could understand what you know what is good design, bad design, what looks good, what doesn't look good, there's still a huge value in that. Maybe you didn't become an artist per se, but uh, I think those skills transition very well to the business world. Yeah. Uh, um. So let's talk about uh, the yellow pages switching John to, over to the dot com because the yellow page is kind of interesting because people paid for slots for advertising and to sell things. And then the you know, internet was a way to sell things, but a lot of people didn't notice that right away. Like how was that transition, John, and, and any stories that you have there? Well, so I, uh, when, when my last year of college, one of the biggest things that ever happened in the business world uh, happened where the largest company in the world was broken up by the federal government, AT&T, not the current AT&T we know today, but the original AT&T, Alexander Graham Bell's AT&T, um, was the largest, most powerful company in the world. And it was uh, the United States government determined it was a monopoly and broke it into eight separate companies. And that was, as I was leaving school, they had five major lines of business, most of them regulated, you know, making a phone equipment had to be regulated. You have to have the right components and all that. You had to be regulated to be offering local dial tone and long distance calls. But one of their uh, ones was not regulated. And in fact, uh, they had let the walking fingers logo and the term yellow pages fall into the public domain. So they weren't trademarked. And so hundreds of independent publishers sprouted up to compete against the now broken up bell system. And so I was one of those. And so in the Seattle area, I went to my home, back to my hometown after college in the Seattle area and started an independent Yellow Pages publishing company. And the Yellow Pages is, was extremely lucrative. It actually was only about 10% of the revenue of AT&T, but about 50% of its net profits. And so um, it, it was a business that in and of itself for AT&T was 50% net profits, that business unit. Um, and so, so imagine having a business where your net profit is 50%, right? And so it was wildly lucrative. Everybody that ever bought ads in there realized how expensive those ads used to be because it was a monopoly. But when it broke up, we were able to offer much lower rates, bring innovation to the product. And so for about 10, 12 years, I ran a print company that was very innovative, bringing color phone books and lots of innovation, you know, the color printing, because before it was just black ink on yellow paper. And all of a sudden now we're having four full color ads and it was really good. But then in 1994, late 1994, um, an interesting thing happened and uh, a, a kind of a quirky guy walked into my office in Seattle, my print publishing company, and told me that print yellow pages was going to be soon wiped out. And uh, and he said this thing called the internet was going to be the basis of it. And uh, I said, you mean that thing for scientists and for academics? And he goes, no, yeah, but an attorney just commercialized it. He did an ad and he got so much business. Now everybody thinks it's commercial. And uh, especially for databases like Yellow Pages, is basically a database of businesses, right? And so um, in January 95, I launched the first ever Internet Yellow Pages and um, before Netscape went public. And so I tinkered with it for a year, year and a half. And in fact, instead of just making it my phone books online, I got 40 other publishers to join me and put their phone books online. But then Netscape went public in 96. And of course, the world's never been the same since when Mark Andreessen had the graphical user interface for port 80 of the Internet changing the world. And um, and then so we debuted ours and we became one of the leaders in trying to put Yellow Pages on the Internet. And then uh, I merged in 
early 96 with three guys that were at Microsoft working the same thing. Microsoft had been talking to me along with about nine other major, I mean, talking that some of the baby bell companies, all that wanted to acquire me, mer- look at what I was doing. And I, I merged in with three Microsoft guys um, that were only 30 days old in their company. And we merged my yellow page, online yellow page company, and that became InfoSpace. And two years later, we were public on the NASDAQ. And uh, it was a wild ride. Went from four or five people to like 1,500 employees and stuff like that. It was a total dot-com experience. Yeah. And, and speaking so, with the dot-com, did, did, the, did the dot-com bus affect you? I'm sure it did, right? Yes, yes, yes. We, we went to dizzying heights in our share price. Uh, we, were ne- we never had any debt. We were always profitable and had lots of money in the bank. Uh, but our share price went to dizzying heights. And then when the crash happened, and I still remember the exact date, March 14th, 2000. On March 14th, 2000, we started to fall. And by the end of the year, we went from $138.5 a share down to $1 a share. So, <laughs> and I mean, and I'm, I assume that you had a ton of shares. So, like, how did yeah, you so deal I, with I, that? I, I got a good, I only got about a quarter of my holdings off the table and about 75% I rode down. But that's what happens when, you know, you're early in and, and a high position in a company, you're blocked from selling at certain times and stuff. But that's, and also I could have sold more, but it's a big lesson in life. I've taught my kids all that too, you know, um, about taking your profits and not, you know, thinking, uh, I, you know, a lot of people got in trouble thinking, hey, this is going to come back someday, but it never really came back. Matter of fact, it got so low, we had to do a reverse stock split and uh, and all that type of stuff. But, you know, the dot com era from March of 2000 to about May of 2003 was a really dark time for Internet. People that were naysayers on the Internet were saying, see, we told you the Internet was a waste of time. It was all fluff, you know, kind of like they say about crypto now and mm-hmm, all sorts of mm-hmm. stuff. And of course, in May of 93, when it came back, it's never stopped since. And a lot of companies that luckily survived for in that two, three year period now are some of the biggest, most successful companies in history. Right. So the Amazons, the Googles, the Apples and what they've done and the capitalized and all that. It's just amazing. But anyway, so uh, that was my birth. I um, left in 2001. The Internet Yale pages we started was good. And we actually, if you go back in the history of Internet Yale pages, we're a real dominant leader and all that. But when Google really took off, obviously, as we all now know, Google's entire search business is the ultimate Yellow Pages and more, right? And so Google is really the real threat that it was. Google eclipsed everything by probably 2003 to 2005. And anyway, I was uh, I became a professor of entrepreneurship at my alma mater in Utah, Brigham Young University, taught for 12 years. And I enjoyed that. And I was a, I became a very active angel investor. Utah's had uh, the 2000 decade was awesome. A real lift up for Utah in the tech world with companies like Omniture selling to Adobe, bringing Adobe to Utah. And the last 10 years in Utah, 2010 to, 20, to 2020, was like an, an, a renaissance era for Utah's on fire for the last decade. And we've had so many unicorns and so much happen. It's kind of been fun to be an angel investor during that time. Do you think that there's going to be uh, a further separation or, I guess, additions of areas that have kind of these, you know, uh, a bunch of a startup space, a bunch of fun- venture funding, not just going from the valley, but to yeah, I, I think, all the I think Silicon Valley. I think Silicon Valley is its own universe for sure. And in, 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 you know, they think they're the center of the universe and they probably are. So there you go. But um, Austin, Austin's really important, right? where you're at. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've been to Austin many times. uh, Tyler has a history, a real leading company that was doing very innovative debt in what's called um, social lending was out of Austin that helped Tyler get through a cash flow crunch at his company that really helped. And then after that, they sold for a boatload to a big public company and that company in Austin helped them. And so Austin's got a good, rich history with us, too. We like Austin. Utah is one of those places, too. Of course, there's several around the country. So the answer is yes. And I think what's interesting about Utah, when Adobe bought Omniture and Adobe came out to Utah, 
as their third biggest campus in the world after Silicon Valley in India, um, a lot of people from California wanted to relocate to Utah because they could keep their same salary and have about 40% more spending power and a better lifestyle where you've got outdoor things that are incredible within 20 minutes where they were living. And so now there's like 2000 employees for Adobe right here and, you know, just close to where Tyler and I live. And that spurred so much. Now we've got Qualtrics and Divi and Podium, all these companies that have literally raised hundred million dollars in our multi-billion dollar unicorns. And it's just, it's pretty interesting how the last 10 years has gone. And what, besides cost of living, what other advantages do you see in other places like Utah or wherever that is not in the Valley? Because I'm seeing this all over the place and I think it's very exciting but do you think so there's Utah, other advantages besides just the yeah. cost of living? Utah, Utah's biggest thing is the workforce, highly educated workforce that's willing to be very strong, loyal workers. It's just the culture out here is to work hard while you're at work and be loyal to your company. And what's really burgeoned, going back again from Omniture, which was one of the first great SaaS companies right in there with Salesforce.com and stuff. They, um, it was, you know, it was, if people don't know Omniture, it was the leading web analytics company and Adobe bought that. So Adobe Analytics is now what that was. And they, um, what happened is we now are a hotbed for B2B SaaS. So Utah is known as a, where if you need to find talent, whether it be software engineering talent or especially sales and business development talent, Utah is a place to go. Right now, we can spin up a B2B SaaS and have all the talent here, and it's just pretty amazing. That's really, that we. there's so many, it's it's almost hard to imagine how many there are just within, uh, you know, a fairly small population base of how many B2B SaaS success stories there are. And, and that's, so it's the sales. Like, I think what it is is, you, Sil- my last, what I like to say is Silicon Valley does deeper tech and better engineering, but... Utah knows how to sell stuff. <laughs> we know how to generate revenue and make money. And you can go look at the history. I mean, a simple software, and then granted, it's Cadillac software like Qualtrics. Look at what they did. Sold for $8 billion to SAP. And a lot of that's to do with they just learned how to sell and sell really well. And that's true of a lot of these companies. Like Divi. Divi was started, what, six years ago and just sold to Bill.com for $2.4 billion. They know how to sell. And, and Tyler, would you agree with that growing up in Utah? Or is it like one of those things where where you go to Silicon Valley now, you're like, oh man, I wish I was here. No, I, I, I think Utah is one of the hubs, one of the many across the United States that is now building its own kind of center for entrepreneurship and technology specifically. And again, yeah, I think maybe our sales force here in Utah might be a strength, right? Where, yeah, you can go out and, and, and founders and technologists can find amazing people to add onto their team and build their core team and start making amazing products and, 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 and sales right here in Utah. You don't have to go to the coasts or, you know, outside of here. And, and I think that's true for a lot of different places, you know, technology and what COVID did to our workforces over the last two years has really changed the way that people are working. And I think it's efficient, but at the same time, I'm kind of an old schooler guy where I do like being in a room with people working side by side, but at the same time, you can accomplish a ton of crap outside of those, those coasts and especially Silicon Valley. But again, I'm sure the people in Silicon Valley are going to have the opposite opinion of that. So Utah, you, just to add to that, Utah has had two industries where it was the uh, world leader in, in that, um, what we call the network marketing industry. Some people call the multi-level marketing industry. You know, that's hard sales. I mean, that's hardcore sales. And then massive numbers of young people also in Utah going to what we call the summer sales industry, mostly with selling alarms and pest control door to door. And mm-hmm. now there's other products being sold. But literally, if you go around the world, nowhere is the center for those two industries and they're rather big, you know, like Vivint and Vivint Solar are multi-billion dollar companies that have legions of young a door-to-door salespeople. And so they just learn how to sell in the hardest, most gritty sales type environment. And then when they go and join a B2B SaaS company that has a great product and a easier sales environment, right. they, they just kill it. They yeah. just kill it. Yeah. So Tyler, let's talk about when you founded uh, Dev Mountain or you're a part of, mm-hmm. um, how that happened and the exit and kind of that whole story. 
yeah. So when I got out of college, I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. Again, I talked about that dating application um, that I basically built throughout my college years for two and a half years, the, the latter half of my college education. And right when I got out of college, we actually sold that uh, technology and that application off to a competitor of ours. So I was free and clear from that 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 company. I was like, okay, what am I going to do next? Um, and so my dad, again, he's been an angel investor for like the last 25 years, specifically here in Utah. And uh, something that he did earlier on, right when I was graduating out of college, um, he started a like the the local uh, accelerator program here in Utah that was called Boom Startup. Boom Startup kind of was like the tech stars of Utah or like the YC of Utah. Um, obviously not on that caliber or level just because we weren't in Silicon Valley. But at the time for in Utah, that it was a great program. You know, they would take in about 10 companies a, a summer, uh, house them, mentor them, give them resources, curriculum, train them, you know, and just accelerate what they were doing on, and, and the growth paths that they were already on. And so that summer um, that I graduated from college, I my dad said, hey, why don't you just kind of figure out what you want to do for next steps after selling that that dating application? And come be kind of the entrepreneur in house and 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 the program manager for Boom Startup for that summer. I said okay, and so I was around awesome companies and kind of the you know the newest wave and, and generation of entrepreneurs in Utah and founders. Uh, and I saw this huge need. Every single founder needed a programmer or a developer or a technologist of some kind. Every single one in that that accelerator program was just clamoring for tech help. And I was, you know, a bit of a technologist at the time. Again, I could work my way around code and, you know, I, I programmed some things, especially on the front end of things. And uh, again, just being around computers the whole time, I, I kind of, I could navigate that space pretty well. Um, but there just wasn't enough people in Utah to, to feed the beast that all these technology companies needed technologists. And so, that that program that summer was housed out of a co-working space and the co-working space kind of said, Hey, we, we, we need to do some kind of programming to bring more people. So because of my association with boom startup being housed out of that co-working space, I also got to know the owners of the co-working space and kind of collaborated with them. And they were saying, Hey, we need to bring more traffic. It was a brand new co-working space. And he said, Tyler, do you have any ideas of what we could do to bring more traffic and let people know that we're here like boom startups here, but we want like the general, entrepreneurial population know to know that we're here to come house out of here and take up space and you know be innovative and you know grow the culture and the ecosystem here in Utah in this co-working space and so we all kind of put our heads around the table and we said hey what 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 about like coding classes what 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 if we taught people technology so instead of like finding all these companies technologists like what if we just taught people to be technologists and grew the actual foundational like size of you know, technologists in Utah and the co-working space was like, that's a great idea. We're going to give you free space. If you just like whip up the classes and uh, you know, I found my co-founder of dev mountain, who's who was at the time, like a 10 year seasoned um, developer, much smarter than I ever was. And he started building the curriculum and, you know, it was just a part-time thing. We said, okay, Hey, we're just going to offer these part-time coding classes like every Tuesday and Thursday from like 7 to 9 p.m. after hours. So if you want to come learn to code for a few weeks, like we'll just teach you how to code. And we slapped up a, you know, a website, we bought the $9 domain name, you know, from GoDaddy. And uh, of course, we called it Dev Mountain because we're in the mountains of Utah. I don't know. That's where the name came from. And we and literally after a week of just having that website up for applications to come to our mini after hours boot camp, you know, we had 75 applications for like a, a 20 person class or a 15 person class, a really small scale class. And we said, whoa, people want to learn this stuff. People want to learn how to code. People want to learn how to become developers and, and, and program and, you know, write software and SaaS software specifically. And so we held that first class. It was a 12 week program, Tuesdays and Thursdays for two hours. And it was wildly successful. Like we had people who were coming in as, you know, Subway sandwich makers and then leaving after 12 weeks and going and getting a job at like Adobe. And we're like, whoa, how did that just happen? This is actually happening. 
But what we noticed was, you know, the goal was to kind of feed startups. But we started feeding like the big tech players in town. Yeah. You know, they just came into these cohorts of, of coders and just took the whole the whole class after the program was over. And they're just like, yeah, we'll take all 20 of these guys. And I'm like, OK, so we accomplished what we set out to do. And, you know, it just kind of snowballed from there. After that first class, we did like 20 people. The next class, we did like 40 people. We did multiple classes at a time you know we grew out of just little provo utah we went to you know the surrounding states and we had six or seven locations in like a few years and you know we were pumping out a ton a ton of developers um but what was so cool was that the actual product worked right it, it actually the model worked where anybody and everybody could come in and learn these skills they don't have to go to like a four-year degree program go through all these generals and required classes to finally get to like the 400 level classes and actually obtain these skills. The boot camp model was working in that anybody could come. It was super accessible and you could really get hands on a keyboard, learn these skills and then be really, really marketable in the marketplace. And those kind of jobs, everybody was looking for those kind of people. So and they, they still was, are. Yeah. Story. Yeah. Let me tell you an anecdotal story just around what Tyler's talking about. So I, I helped advise in that company and they Tyler is going to be humble about it, but he and his co-founders just killed it on execution at the perfect timing for coding schools uh, like this. And there were several around the country that got going, but they just killed it and became one of the best run ones and fastest growing. But what was interesting, like their second or third cohort, they would do a demo day in the early days where at the end of the 12 weeks, they would have all of them in one room and show off what they had coded during. The yeah, kind of like a hiring day at the end of the program. Yeah. And so I went I went one time and there was this young woman who's there and I, and I walked up and I said, so sh show me what you got, what you did. And I, and then I said, how did you get here? Why are you here? What are you doing? And I just want to know the story. She goes, well, I got my degree in economics, couldn't get a job. I had tried for almost a year and I was about to go home and live in my parents' basement in Minnesota and take a waitressing job. And I go, what? And then she goes, I saw a billboard or heard about this. And I signed up for this, thought this might be interesting. And I go, okay, so what happened? She, she goes, she goes, well, about six weeks into this 12 weeks, I got three job offers. They would get job offers before the 12 weeks was over. Wow. And I go, what? I go, what? And she goes, yeah, one job offer. She was going to get a waitress job for like $24,000 in Minnesota. No joke. And she goes, I uh, got a job offer, one for uh, 75000 one for 65000 one for 55000 I go, so what'd you take? And she goes, oh, I took the 75,000, just a better fit. I go, so what the heck? So she goes from like 24,000 living in her parents' basement, staying in Utah as a coder at a tech company in like weeks. It's great. That's amazing. Yeah. And, I, and I, a big takeaway actually that I have for that, even as it's the starting of the company, that it doesn't have to be this perfectly planned, meticulous idea, but you have this idea and you you went with it right away. Like you just started well, and, immediately. And part of the story that I, I didn't say was after that boom, after being the program manager for that, ex, that local accelerator here in Utah, boom startup, I actually joined on one of the portfolio companies. One of the accelerator companies asked me to come and, 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 and join them. So I was the first employee at, besides the founders of this, this actual medical software company. They were trying to create this uh, software platform for uh, the genetic space, interpreting genetic data and, and, and displaying it in a software platform. And so I took a job with them actually. And so during the course of the summer programs, then, you know, even like six months into that job finally is when kind of the dev mountain idea came along and started flourishing. And so again, it was a very, very part-time thing like, Hey, yeah, I'll just help kind of do this. And, you know, set up the curriculum and kind of get people in, you know, butts and seats and, you know, draw some more attention to that co-working space. And by no means was this ever like, hey, this is the idea. Let's sit down and like articulate this and like, hey, who's the founders? And like, hey, this, this some grandiose plan. It was just more like, hey, let's kind of do this. Oh, we're experiencing traction. Okay, let's dedicate more time to this. Oh, we're getting more traction. And while I was over at a full time other startup gig and job, but eventually I had to let that go because Dev Mountain becomes such a, a big thing that I, I had to focus all my time and efforts because I, I believe part time entrepreneurship is never successful. So I left that other company, 
went heads down and focused on Dev Mountain and it, and it became what it was today to where eventually after three years, we actually were acquired by a, a large education company. So your, it, your it listeners might like this story. So Tyler had to make a big decision there to leave a job that he was actually getting his salary for and go be a founder, right? That's a yeah. big decision to do. And um, my son, I have a son-in-law who faced that same type of decision and made the decision to take half the salary to join a startup, taking a 50% salary cut. And just as with Tyler, that son-in-law, it turned out really well because he put his head down, worked in that startup and it sold last year and his equity in that company. Uh, did really well for him. And so for, to your listeners, it's a tough decision. But if you're all in on entrepreneurship and you keep at it, a lot of the equity you get in these companies can make up for the salary sacrifice the first couple of years. And it's only a year or two of real salary sacrifice. Tyler and my son-in-law, two years into their ventures, were at better or higher salaries than they had previously. But then- Oh, no. Yeah. Six yeah. months into it, I was at a better salary than yeah. I was. For. Yeah. And plus then you had all your equity. So yeah. it's, it's just kind of interesting. It's really scary at the moment for a lot of entrepreneurs to give up a job and get into a startup. But if they do things right and use good science as well as make good decisions, often one, two years later, they'll find themselves with back at the same salary they were, plus the equity in hand. So. I think that's fantastic. And, and Tyler, you probably grew up with a different mentality than most people. So you were able to do that jump off the cliff, you know, leap probably easier than others. But another that's thing true. that a lot of people get stuck at is they find something like you could have done that and just done the one location, eight people, you know, eight, eight students or whatever you call them and just done that forever. How yeah. did you... Is there any advice here of how to take an idea that you already, hey, that we know it works now and scale it up? You know, Dev, we were really l lucky with Dev Mountain because it's not your typical product development process, which is either bootstrap something on really, really cheap and try to build a product, whether that be software or a consumer good or a physical product, and then go and sell it. Dev Mountain, the education model was actually really backwards. It was almost like the Kickstarter model where the Kickstarter model is, here's an idea. I'm going to put it in front of a group of people. They're going to fund the idea. And then I go and execute and build the product. And it was kind of the same with Dev Mountain where education was on day one of the class, the full tuition was due. If you didn't pay tuition to our class, you were not coming and you were not accepted in, into that cohort of, of class. So before we paid any teachers, before we paid any mentoring or spent any money on the actual delivering of the class, we had money in our bank account. Even from day one, you know, again, I bought a $9 domain name, put up, hey, we're going to teach coding classes. And I've received 75 applications where I could be picky choosy of who even came into the class. Then I said, hey, pay your tuitions or you're not going to be accepted in this class. And so I had and I think we charged like 23 or 2100 bucks for that very first class for with like, you know, 15 people. And so I had like 40 grand in a bank account on day one of where then I could go and pay teachers, pay mentors, you know, build a curriculum out further. You know, honestly, that first class, every class we, we built the curriculum like two days before we actually delivered the class, you know, so it was like we would pay people to come in. Either my my co-founder would do it or he would have a little a friend, a developer or a software engineer friend that would develop it with him and he would pay him at like a small hourly wage. So, you know, we had money to spend and, and develop the product and make the product better. So we got really lucky there. We never raised a dollar on Dev Mountain because it was always self-funded in, in that model. So it's such, it's such a strong cash flow business. And as Tyler tells it, I just smiling because I think about fast forward, like 18, 24 months. And at one point in just their Provo location, they had like five or six concurrent classes with over 30 students and tuition went now up to about 11,500 per Wow. Yeah. And, 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 and I remember Tyler one day, this is the fun things about entrepreneurship. Tyler calls me and goes, dad, I'm sitting here watching the money come into our bank account so fast <laughs> because <laughs> it was just it was it was a great they just really i think the learning there though is like build a product that people actually want and entrepreneurship yeah. is super easy 
<laughs> so you, right. you have to validate that on the front end, right? You have to say, before I was dropping, you know, my own $40,000 in cash and developing this amazing curriculum before even like, like shouting it off to the rooftops, I shouted it off to the rooftops at the beginning and said, hey, we're going to teach closing, coding classes. Who wants to do this? And I, we kind of, you know, practice lean startup or, you know, validating the idea and the business model before actually building it or delivering it, right? It's where a lot of entrepreneurs do that backwards. They build a product or they they spend time and money and resources building this idea they think is good and then they launch to market and it's just crickets and they get no traction whatsoever and they just lost two years of their life, $50,000 of, of their savings and, you know, precious, precious time, you know. And so you got to validate things on the front end rather than valid trying to validate on the back end. Does that make sense? So. I yeah, think that's and really what, what are some ways to validate your idea? So there's a lot of people that love, they want to create a startup. You know, being an entrepreneur is, it's cool nowadays. And they have these ideas. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of validating your idea as well. But what, what are some ways to do that? What is some advice there? T talking to your, your target market right away. You know, if I have an idea to, to sell bananas on a street corner, before I build the banana stand, and invest in banana inventory, ship them from, you know, Mexico and get them up to Provo, Utah and want to sell them on Center Street in Provo, Utah, go talk to people on Center Street and say, hey, if I started a banana stand, would you buy bananas from me? And if I can talk to 100 people that say, yeah, I come here every day, I'd buy a banana from you every day. If you had a banana stand right here, I'd be like, okay, then it's probably a pretty good idea to start a banana stand on Center Street in Provo. You know what I mean? Like, Talk to the people you think you can sell to and validate that they will actually buy what you're going to make or produce or, or, or sell. It's really, it's, it's free actually. You just have, it's just time. You just have to go spend your time talking to people, but it's free. You spend no, no money whatsoever. And I think a lot of people don't, don't understand that. And what about the person that <clears throat> might say, okay, that's easy for you. you. You know, you're very outgoing and you've done all these things before, you know, maybe they're more of an engineer what advice would you have for that person that's probably going to be a little better. nervous? If you're an engineer, oh my gosh, there's so many free tools now where you can start a Squarespace or Shopify or um, you know any of these no-code programs where you can start a landing page. Anytime I have an idea as a, as a technologist, anytime I have an idea, I go and do a, a start a landing page and it says, hey, I'm going to start a, a banana stand on Center Street in Provo and I buy bananastandrus.com and I put like a little subscription, email subscription, you know, field on there and says, if you're interested in banana stands in Provo, put your email here and I'll let you know when we're launching, right? And if over the course of a month, I get 100 emails on that subscription list, 500 emails on that subscription list, like that's a good traction indicator. And I'm validating that idea without actually even talking to anybody, but I, maybe I'm pushing people to that website and seeing if they're subscribing or, you know, telling people that I am interacting with on the daily, that banana stands rs.com URL, you know, you know what I mean? Like you, you can validate a lot of ways, go and slap that on Reddit, go and slap that on Quora. Hey guys, you know, I'm going to start a business. Anybody local to the Provo area, Utah, like here's my URL, go check it out. Let me know if you're interested, if you are subscribed to my newsletter and I'll let you know on updates of when we're launching, you know, stuff like that. So Darren, just to add to that too, and to an engineer, the, the great news is the, the movement over the last 13 to 15 years in lean startup, you know, ever since Steve Blank uh, and others in the leadership of that movement have put out their products, uh, the, it's a codified system now. Uh, that, that engineer can literally buy a $30 book. They can go to a startup boot camp like our startup ignition, and they can get trained step by step on a codified system for validating your ideas and then hypothesizing a business model and validating your business model hypothesis. It's not magic. It's not an art as much as it is a science and using the scientific method to validate your hypotheses and the experiments that you would conduct are going to talking to customers, building a very light version of the product an MVP, you know, all of this. And it, what's fantastic today is, my, I back tested my entire career with lean startup process and it explained all my successes and failures when it was introduced to me in the late 2000s. And I go, wow, 
So in the past, I actually stumbled on success by following lean startup without knowing what it was. Like, for instance, my biggest success of all time is because I was inside the industry and was able to go talk to hundreds of my target partners and customers. And I launched based on what they said they wanted and would do. Now, the times I failed and I have failed many times is when I thought I was smart and knew what I and everybody would think just like me and want it just like me. And so I built the product and launched. And then, as Tyler said, crickets. And so that engineer needs to know there's so many resources now for helping him understand a codified system like even if I just run a person one time and say, go get the startup owner's manual by Steve Blank, that book, read it. It's an encyclopedic how-to manual and just follow that. And people will write me back six months later and go, John, where was this book? I needed this book 20 years ago. I would have saved so much time and money in my life. And it's just so you can do that. And then if you find a mentor that knows how to mentor you on that, it is go, it gets turned up to even higher levels. So the I, I actually got started in education and entrepreneurship, became an academic, not a real true academic, I'm not a PhD, but a a teacher at a university in entrepreneurship, and then doing our own boot camp specifically for engineers. In my career, I was noticing how a lot of time engineers were taken advantage of by building great products and not getting very big equity stakes in companies and just kind of being the workhorse upon which things were built and not getting their fair share. So I, my, one of my greatest things I enjoy is teaching an engineer about the business side of entrepreneurship. And that is really at the core of our mission and what we love to do. There's nothing better than an incredible engineer who learns the business side of business. Absolutely. And there's so many different questions to have off of that. But first, there's <laughs> always money in the banana stand. We're long-winded. We're that, really uh, long-winded. That, that actually makes my job way easier. But first, <laughs> one, one thing you mentioned in there is mentors and mentorship. Any advice in somebody how to find a mentor? Like, let's say it just doesn't naturally happen, which even I would give advice to say, even does that naturally ha- happen, go find another one. But any advice that you would have to find a mentor, how to do it? So that's it. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll, I'll take that first and then Tyler can add on to his thoughts as a kind of a younger, more recent entrepreneur out there. But uh, I, we offer a lot of mentorship and we have people that come from other nations and other states, you know, from the East Coast, whatever, come out to Utah and participate in our boot camp. It's a live boot camp. It's not online. It's live. And so uh, I help many people, whether it be Tampa or wherever it is in the country, Michigan, I can go online and help them find resources they didn't even know exist in their areas. The, you know, you're from Austin, we're from Utah, two real hotbeds, and it's really easy to find stuff in Austin and Utah compared to a lot of other places. But in these other places, there's still things going on. There's still groups, there's still meetups, and there's things happening, and there's resources you can find and look at that. And then I, I also tell them uh, it's you need two kinds of mentors. You need the sage wisdom of somebody who's been there, done it for a long time like me, but you also should go find mentors that are six months to two years ahead of you doing something similar. There's nothing better than peer-to-peer mentorship where somebody is literally six months, 12 months down the road from where you are right now, and they can share what they did to get over the issues and hurdles and obstacles that you're about to face. And matter of fact, in our boot camps and in the accelerator I ran, Often the peer-to-peer mentoring was just as important as the sage wisdom mentoring. Does that make sense? Because Mm -hmm. uh, they can help solve problems right away because they go, oh, here's what I did. I had that same problem. This is what I did last week to overcome that problem. And that's invaluable, right? So I would try to join meetups and groups of local entrepreneurs in almost every major city in America. There's going to be meetups of entrepreneurs getting together. And I would start there. I completely agree. There's um, there's also something powerful being around those type of people because it makes what you're going to do less intimidating because they're doing it and they're all doing it. And it's like, well, why can't I do it? Especially the more you get around there. And also entrepreneurs, yeah. they go to these events. They're, they're looking for people to talk to. They're looking to pitch their idea to you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so two, it's, two I, things there, exactly what you're saying. They, um, y- you know, like you said, when the peer to peer and you're meeting there, well, one key, I just want to point out what happens at these meetups and those events and being around having the confidence, you know, uh, saying like you kind of said to Tyler, 
somebody looked at me and go, yeah, John, you've been doing it for 25 years and you can do it because you know exactly what to do. But when you see somebody who's only six months ahead of you doing it, you, it is inspiring. And then the other thing that happens a lot in our boot camp and at these meetups is often you've got a piece of the puzzle. Somebody else there has the other piece of the puzzle and you come together. Some of our best companies that have emerged from our boot camp are when two people come to the boot camp. One has a stronger idea. This idea needs to be abandoned, but they're a talented individual now being trained and understanding what to do. They come together and merge. So let's say a tech guy has a great idea for a product and the biz guy's idea is not that good and he abandons it and they join together. We've had about 20 cases where that one plus one equaled three and they went on to great success by one of them abandoning their idea and jumping on the idea of the other. And that's kind of the collisions is the reasons universities are important is we have people colliding and creating great things. Most of the great companies were born on university campuses because they collide with boot camps and meetups and the things we're all doing. And I know in Austin, there's tons of these that it's really not the event or sometimes even the content of the event that's that great. It's the fact that you come together and collide with one another and you have one plus one equaling three. I agree. Talk to me about the, and this is for either y'all or both, uh, boot camps versus incubators versus accelerators. Okay, I'll start and then Tyler can give his thoughts on that just because I've been around. So accelerators were really hot, hot, hot from the day Y Accommodator and Techstar started around 2006, 2007. And we started one here in Utah and uh, Brad Feld and David Cohen of Techstars gave me their playbook and we just emulated Techstars because they were in Boulder, a college town, and we're in Provo, uh, a big college town. We have two universities within 10 minutes of each other with over 30,000 students in each university. And so we uh, did the same thing. It was really successful and went great. But as you know, accelerators for around $20,000 take about 6%, 7% of the company, which is a really low valuation. And also often it was, we didn't do this, but others did. And it's often got anti-dilution in it clause mm -hmm. where when you get your first round, they protect the 6% by ratcheting up the number of shares to the accelerator. So around when the market took back off after the great recession around 2012, 2013, 2014, a lot of backlash came from that, you know, giving up such a big chunk of your company for not very much money and all that. And now today's accelerators aren't doing that. You know, I think the top we, ones, the top ones are. We right. just had a startup ignition alum just that what came out of our boot camp got accepted into YC this summer. And I think they told me they got hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of investment yeah. now. Yeah, for, it's better it, now. But, typically, but, yeah, but 150, 120, but it's still the six or seven percent. Yeah. Yeah, 150K, yeah. you know, but yeah, yeah that's so, better than in 2010 when you were giving, yeah, 20K for six or seven. So, so there was so. a little backlash. So I actually sold my half of Boom Startup to my co-founder of Boom Startup. And we moved on. I moved on from the accelerator world and then got into what Startup Initiative is, is I call that more of a pre-accelerator. And that's where we only charge tuition. We don't take any equity and we kind of prep. The Startup Initial Alumnus is a great candidate for Y Combinator, for instance. That's it's really they're set up to just go right into that. And that's where we flourish and what we do really well. So the difference of, of a venture studio or any kind of program that is tuition only or trading maybe services for equity uh, and all that um, versus the cash for equity of a pure seed accelerator is that I think. Just I think the entrepreneurs are so much more savvy now that they're realizing they don't need to give up too much equity for low value being produced. And I and then one other thought, I'll be honest with you, after Y Combinator and Techstars and you go pretty far down on the list of the hundreds and hundreds of accelerators that exist, they're not that great. I mean, they don't deliver. If you get into Y Combinator and Techstars Boulder, you're going to have a good outcome probably. But once you go down the list very far and uh, what I tell entrepreneurs, and this will be my last long winded, as Tyler says, answer on this topic is that I tell an entrepreneur, they say, oh, we got accepted into this accelerator and this accelerator. I said, go call up three of the last cohorts CEOs and ask them if they would do that accelerator again. That'll tell you everything. And that's the best thing. Anybody that's thinking about going to accelerator or has been accepted into accelerator and doesn't know if they should do it, they should go find out who the 10 or 12 companies were in that cohort, whatever the number was, call up three of them 
randomly and ask them, would they do it again? And what was their experience like? That's the most important thing they can do to find out if it's worth it. Uh, any Tyler, other yeah, any other uh, additions? Well, or? I, I, maybe just a little bit of background on what we do. So yeah, my dad and I do work together now in a boot camp called Startup Ignition, which is an entrepreneurial startup boot camp, kind of teaching what to do and what not to do in the first six months to 24 months of starting your business. We feel like we've started enough and have enough experience now that we can help other entrepreneurs kind of accelerate that process and and mentor them to to find a really good working business model. And that that birthed out of my experience with Dev Mountain, which was the same thing we were doing with technology and development and software engineering and software building. Instead of teaching tech, um, my dad had some students at his at his university come up to him and say, hey, wh- wh- why don't you teach this kind of stuff in a boot camp like model, like what your son's doing with Dev Mountain? Why don't you take your 12 years of building curriculum in a university format and bring it out of the university and put it into a boot camp. And so that that's where startup ignition came from. And so my dad, of course, was took all of the curriculum that he had built. And I took my experience from Dead Mountain and we put them together and we said, hey, we're going to do an entrepreneurial boot camp. And that's what we've now been doing since 2015. We've had hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs and, and companies come through that program. And again, we don't take any equity. We don't. We don't do the accelerator model. We charge a small little tuition just so that the entrepreneur has some skin in the game because we actually gave it away for free for a little while. We noticed that just people weren't taking it as seriously. We're just like, hey, we just we don't even want to make a buck off of this. We just want to get as many people educated in startup education as possible. But we noticed that entrepreneurs, when they came through for with something free, they didn't take it as like, you know, life changing as we wanted them to do. So we just charge a small tuition to have them have a little bit of skin in the game. And, and you know, have that, so they're a little bit more dedicated to it. But it's, we've been doing that now. And it's it's been really, really awesome. We've had a ton of awesome companies that have gone through that program, a ton of awesome entrepreneurs. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that you know, I'm a little bit biased because, you know, the the lead teacher of, a, of Startup Ignition is someone that I'm very closely related to and I've had a, a, as a mentor in my back pocket for my whole life. So it, my dad. So but I think it's really, really well worth it. And I think any Startup Ignition alumni that you would talk to would say, yeah, John is an amazing mentor and, and knows exactly what he's doing. And I think that just comes from experience. You know, he's been able to see everything and anything and everything, any kind of problem an entrepreneur has. You know, he has a solution because he said, oh, yeah, I've actually helped other entrepreneurs or I've experienced that myself. And here's exactly what we did. You know, that's just mentorship in a nutshell. So it's great. Absolutely. What about funding? Let's talk about funding. Like, uh, let's say you got a startup, whether you're at idea stage or you're moving along, when to get funding, how to do it, any advice and help that for, for others? So I'll, I'll just start. Obviously, in the realm in which we're talking here, we're all things entrepreneurship and angel investing. This is a huge topic. And we also capitalize on the fact that most entrepreneurs just think, if I just got the money I think I need, everything would come up roses, right? That's how they always think. And so we use that also to attract them to our boot camp so they get the right kind of mentoring because that's not the right answer. Um, matter of fact, you know, we've had a lot of recent well publicized cases where uh, very uh, well-known entrepreneurs received unlimited capital and still failed because they never found a business model. You know, Quibi is an example with Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman. The recent company Fast that raised $100 million went bankrupt in less than a year. Um, you know, there's all sorts of cases where, um, you know, unlimited money doesn't mean you can plow through having no business model and succeed. You have to find the business model. The good news is business models can be found on the cheap. You don't need 100 million or 1.7 billion like Quibi had <laughs> to find a business model, never found it. They wanted to compete against Netflix and just didn't make it on 1.7 billion. And so uh, the interesting uh, uh, thing in terms of uh, funding is that we need to stop people and come back and say, you know what? I know that you think if you got $500,000 or a million dollars right now, everything would be perfect and it would go like clockwork, but let's come back and let's look at your idea and let's measure your idea scientifically for how strong the idea is in terms of being a business opportunity. And then if we feel it's a good business opportunity, 
Let's find out how well it translates into a business model where we can create, capture, and deliver value in the marketplace. And let's scientifically go through that process. If you can look me square in the eye and I look you square in the eye and we all agree that you have business model that will create, capture, and deliver value in the marketplace, funding will be a natural consequence of that traction and what you're doing. You don't need to go raise money before you're ready to try to force a business model to work that hasn't been validated. And that's or, or search for a business model. I think yeah, a lot of funding companies- Funding a search, right. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of companies prematurely fundraise and they don't actually have a working business model yet. They're actually still searching and validating their business model. And I think a lot of capital is squandered in the VC world trying to fund the task of of, of getting a business model. Yeah. But I think when a company and a founder can literally say, yes, we have a business model, model which means, yeah, you validated the idea with the customers and the target segment and your target customers, and you have maybe, uh, you, you've talked to, I don't know, 100 of your prospective clients and 80 or 70 or 90% of them said, yes, if you build that, we will buy it kind of mentality. Then I'd say, okay, then you have some, the beginning of a working business model that sure. Now you need to fund it because you need to build product. You have customers saying they're going to buy it, but now you just need to build it kind of thing. But yeah, a lot we, of, I, I just say we have a lot of cases. It's so fun. Um, one of my favorite stories of all time is a company that took 11 pivots to get to the winning business model. And they would, the day, I never forget the day they walked in to talk to me and say, we finally nailed it. And it was adding one more feature and they struggled for so, and they did it quite rapidly though. They pivoted 11 times in a pretty rapid time because they kept running into brick walls with going to the target market. When they finally nailed it, they literally went to where they closed. This is a B2B SaaS company. So the company's taking on their software to run their entire business operation. They would go in, it was for golf courses. And so golf course management software. They would go in and when they finally nailed the business model, they were closing courses in 10 minute sales calls. And it was that's the what happens. And they hadn't, they and that company raised very little money and had a massive exit last year. This is no joke. The employees and the founders exited in around a hundred million last year and had still over 90% of the company for themselves. That's amazing. Yeah. And the, the, the art of the pivot, I think a lot of people would have it. They get really stuck to their, their idea and their original thought process. What's some advice on how to pivot or even to know that you should pivot? When you're out talking to the customers, You've got to, you know, Steve Blank likes to say, you know, you've nailed your model when it's still all systems go and you're not learning anything new by talking to your customers. I kind of like to put a number on it where I can repeat the results of talking to 10, 20, 30, 40 customers. And I get the say I get 80 percent of it repeating the same results. So I kind of have an 80 percent rule. And it's just where you know that you've nailed it. Now, the opposite is when you go through and nobody's getting nobody's like and that happens actually much more starkly the problem is entrepreneurs are very guilty of confirmation bias they only listen to data that supports their assumptions and they don't like hearing any negative feedback so but the way we train what happens is we go out and have them go out usually after we say you've got to go talk to 20 customers no less than 20. they'll go out and they'll do one or two, and there's when that's a when the idea is bad, when the the model is a bad hypothesis, they'll find go, John, they hated my idea. I thought they'd love it. I cannot believe they actually hate it and thought it was the stupidest thing they'd ever heard. Now, I some entrepreneurs, they will, if they weren't trained to really accept the data and be open minded, they might say, okay, they were just idiots because that's a company. Those those two were just idiots. I'm sure it's good. I'm not going to go talk anymore. I don't like to talk to people, and have them tell me my baby's ugly. So I'm just going to build a product and see if they'll buy it. That's when you fall into the trap of premature scaling and squandering money like Tyler talked about. But it's so funny. It doesn't take long before when you're talking to customers, when you realize you're really off track. Because if you do it right and let them respond, 
openly and honestly, they'll tell you how. And, and, and honestly, in our boot camp, a lot of attendees that come through our program, that's the outcome that they have. They come in really starry eyed. They're, you know, they're maybe they're working at a local tech company here, but they know they want to be entrepreneurial. They've had this idea in their head for the last two or three years. They're finally going to take a step on executing towards it. They come to our boot camp, learn about lean startup and validating their ideas. So they go out and validate it. And in a week's time, they find out, wow, my idea actually really sucks and no <laughs> one wants this. And but yeah. that's a great outcome because they save time, money and effort in invalidating a business model so that they can move to the next one. You know, entrepreneurs need to fail, 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 fail fast and then finally get on to a, a successful business model. The more time you spend on, on a failed business model the more, you know, times are most precious commodity and we're only getting older. So the earlier you can fail on something and find out, hey, this is not going to work or I need to pivot or I need to abandon completely. That's a great outcome. You know, Darren, I don't know if you know the stat, but the average successful business model that's achieved takes two and a half major pivots to get there. The chance that your first hypothesis for a business model and uh, again, a business model is all the parts and pieces of how you create value that is enough for your customers to part with their money and it's enough for you to deliver it profitably. Okay. So the, uh, it takes two and a half pivots together. So the chance that your first hypothesis is the winner is extremely low. Matter of fact, again, the, a lot of the gurus in the lean startup world put it about one in 200 chance or 0.5% chance. Your first guess is right. So that's, you know, even worse than choosing one number on a roulette wheel. And so, what, what happens is you've got to go out and do this validation and pivot to the right answer. And that's and, kind of a funny thought. So if an entrepreneur sitting behind their desk and thinking about an idea, the chance that that idea will actually ever make it to market or make any money at all or be as successful at all is one out of 200. Yeah. That's, that's so so probably, so, you're probably not going to be successful just thinking yeah. about an idea and executing let on me, it. Let me tell you about one we're working with right now. So this is a, a lawyer who's a really successful personal injury attorney. And he built a piece of software kind of for himself that helps him be a better personal injury uh, attorney. He wants to now, he wants to take it to the whole market, got a team together, uh, wants to take it to other personal injury attorneys, thinks it's sellable to them. They went to 20 personal injury attorneys and none of them cared about it. None of them said it would help them in their business. None of them, all 20, zero for 20. And he can understand why they don't think like him and how he's used it and all that. And he said, well, no, we have a way to do that. Substitute product, substitute way to do it. It's not that important to us. It's just not that important. And then they found out that what the personal attorneys care about was this data issue. And then they said, oh, so they pivot to a data issue and they put together a whole business model and did a lot of work on it. And then they went back out to 20 personal injury law firms and found out that wasn't good enough either. Not enough, really cared enough about it to do it. And while they're doing this process, though, then they stumbled on yet a third completely different idea for a business. And they found out and they put something together, put a business model plan it, and they went out to the 20 again, the personal injury attorney law firms. All of them were saying, now that I would pay for, that I want, that I need. And it had to do with with an interesting, intriguing idea about all the people involved in a personal injury case of how you gathered things. It was really interesting. And, and, And what happened is everybody said, can I buy that? Do you have that now? He goes, no, we're just testing this business model idea. We haven't started building a product yet. But that's when when you get other the other attorneys were saying, can I buy that right now? I want that right now. And then they started going, hey, can I invest in it if you're doing a new company? That's when you start realize, okay, your business model now. But that was their third completely distinct business model, same team. And we, we, we go in our boot camp through the histories of all the great companies, you know, like Twitter itself. Twitter started something totally different. All of them started something totally different. The, it's super unlikely that you start where you're at and make it. Now it happens, but it's unlikely. I mean, like, something that's super that's not interesting. to discourage your listeners at all. What we're trying to say is it, you can actually – Pivot, you can change, you can fail, but you can find success. There's science. Listen, listen to the market. Size, test, yeah. and then be successful. Listen to the market. Inside the brains of your target customer is the magic business model that will make all your dreams come true. Your job is to go into their brain and pull it out and make it a business. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. And I think something that you guys have 
said multiple times here, and I, I actually absolutely love this, is if you have an idea, go and validate it. If you have a business model, go and validate it. If you're in a credit company, go and validate it. it you guys are, you obviously believe this because you've said it multiple times. So if there's one big table takeaway, I think from this episode, I think is to validate your idea, validate that you have customers, validate that people's going to pay real money for it uh, before, you know, getting eight months or four years down the road. Assumptions are very expensive guesses to an entrepreneur. Imagine if you assume your idea is great. You assume you've got a working business model. You spend $200,000 of your friends and family money building a product, and then you launch it and nobody wants it. We've all been around that, right? That's a never needs to happen if we do this right. So, so John, you've gone through multiple exits, including IPO. You've, you've, done, you've mentored thousands of people, professor. What advice would you give when you go back to your like your 16 year old self? What advice would you give yourself? I go back and say, you know, when you thought about putting all your money into Microsoft when in public in 1986, do it. <laughs> 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 Besides that, you know, that if I could time travel, right? But um, ignoring that type of thing, um, I would give the advice and say, um, have confidence in yourself. All the people you're dealing with, they put on one pair of pants at a time. Don't be too intimidated and overwhelmed uh, and thinking that they're special and that they're more capable than you. That in reality, if you put in your time and you learn something, you're every bit as smart and capable as other people. And I try to imbue that now in the young people I teach. I tell them all the people I've seen become multimillionaires through entrepreneurship. And there's been so many and so successful, change the world with great products and service that really bless and help the lives of people. They're no different than you. The only thing they did is they went and did it. They didn't chicken out. They didn't um, let their um, lack of confidence stop them. They let their ambition be stronger than their doubts. And just know that you're every bit as capable as any of these other folks and stay with something. And also, I, and I've learned this and I'm pretty good at it, but stay with your things long enough to let them come to fruition. Let the business model pivot and evolve. Don't give up on things too early. I, that's actually the reason I'm sitting here today and successful. There's been many times in my life where a lot of other people said to give up, it's not working. And I just pivoted until it worked. And I did that naturally without being trained in it like we are today. And that's really important because I, I personally believe any person that takes at least three strong runs in entrepreneurship with a good mentor and with understanding the codified lean startup system will find success. And Tyler, you know, you've done a ton of stuff, uh, entrepreneur, been around a, a ton of startups. What's like five years from now look for, for, for you? You know, what do you got? What do you got planned on the horizon? So that's actually something that we have launching really soon here and is actually kind of an extension of what I'm doing with my dad. So over the last six years, ever since I had an exit in 2016, I've been doing, you know, I've been angel investing and I, I, I like helping other entrepreneurs, finding awesome business models and, you know, investing if it makes financial sense. And so that's what I've been doing and dedicating most of my time to. Um, but just recently, uh, my dad and I, you know, we've become kind of this father son angel investing duo. And um, we've had a ton of wins, especially over the, the COVID era with all the money that's been printing a ton of M&A and activity over 2020, 2021. Um, it's been a great a, a few years for us from an angel investing perspective. But what we've noticed is also we, we see a, a ton of early stage deals and uh, amazing opportunities. And, you know, we're, we're restricted by our own personal capital. Um, and so actually now what we're doing and what we have done is, is about mid this month, we're actually launching a venture fund um, that will be Startup Ignition Ventures, um, not with the only purpose to invest in, in, and fund Startup Ignition alumni or their ideas, um, but anybody and everybody. But we're starting a small little venture fund. Um, that pre, we'll pre seed, we should say. It's a pre-seed yeah, fund. It's a pre-seed fund. Um, so first checks in, very early ideas. That's just because that's where me and my dad can provide a lot of value to entrepreneurs and founders. And um, that's where we like to operate and, you know, where we like to stay and, and, and thrive. And 
were very roll up your sleeves, get in the trenches with you, get in the weeds with you and figure out problem type of investors. And so now we're just going to scale that through a small $20 million pre-seed fund um, that we have the idea to deploy over the next year or two and and, and just do more and help more. And, 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 and we more. should top off on that and say, and the recent corrections in the market that started about three months ago were more bullish than ever on it because yeah. um, the valuations were so frothy at the end of last year. I'm a little worried about all the investing that happened and what down rounds might be faced by some of those investors, maybe, you know, because it was such high valuations. Right now, we're finding great teams. The terms and valuations are coming back down to more normal levels. And I think it's going to be a great time to take time over the next two or three quarters of potential recession and build a company. So an entrepreneur that gets a little bit of money is really frugal with it and builds a, and gets and builds a great business in the next, you know, two to three, four quarters is going to then be ready for the next big run up and uh, will be positioned really well. And we want to be a part of those type of things with what we're doing. So we're actually more excited than ever for what we're doing because of the kind of odd and weird corporate or excuse me, macroeconomic climate that exists today. And as my takeaway, my main takeaway that I hear from that as a founder, a builder is that there's still money out there. So if you have an idea and you're worried about everything's happening, there's still a ton of money out there for, 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 there for people to fund especially, your idea. I don't know if you know, especially pre-seed and early seed. Late stage seed is getting a little harder and series A and B and C is getting harder. So what I I, I think there's going to be a great opportunity, though, for investors to win. Let's say a company's going for its series B and they raised a series A at a super high valuation and they're going to face a down round now. Those investors that go in and do the down round are probably going to be winners too. I've seen I've seen that happen. I've lived through two major boom and bust in the tech world in my career, and incredibly great companies are created, and incredible investor returns happen when you're still putting money in during the down cycle because then when it cycles back up, it's, you know, this is simple math. It's not hard to figure out, but it's just hard to pull the trigger and do sometimes. And, you know, it's kind of like Warren, what's the quote you like to quote Warren Buffett on Tyler? It, you know, when everybody's greedy, be fearful. And when ever, others are fearful, be greedy. So yeah, that's kind of the so, principle. So, so that that's just kind of an interesting thing. And so we see some great things. And just about our own climate here in Utah, and I'm sure you feel uh, similar about Austin, but Utah is kind of on an upward spiral. We think that when we get through this corrective period, that Utah is going to go on its next big run up because we've set the table so well. Right now, in the 2000s, we had success, and that led to the success in the 2010s. We think the mid to latter 2020s in Utah is going to be really full of all of the talent that has been brought to Utah from even outside the area because of these great. We now have so many unicorns, you know, and using the old term of a billion dollar company or larger, Utah, little old Utah with such a small population has it's an outsized number of unicorns. And we think that's brought a lot of talent to the state and that just starts feeding on itself and where you really have a lot of things that could happen. So our vision is that when we're sitting here in 2030, we're going to look back at the last latter half of this decade and go, wow, what another great decade for Utah. So this is my last question. I end every podcast with this question. So this will be to both of you is how would you like to be remembered? Um, I'll go, since I have to worry about that much sooner than Tyler will be, I'll go first. I think I'd like to just be remembered um, first and foremost as a good husband and father. I know that's uh, quaint, but just Tyler and I were with our family yesterday and it just warms my heart. We just have eight grandchildren. Tyler supplied three of them. Uh, He's in tie for first place. And it's just fantastic to, you know, I've been married 39 years. My wife and I just love each other and happier than ever. And it's just, that's really an achievement. And and, in no small way, entrepreneurship has been a part of that. The entrepreneurial lifestyle and what we've been through and having me be happy with what I do. Every day has been new and interesting and I've really loved it and love my work and career. And so I think that feeds in to a good, happy life. And I want to remember for those things in the business world, I do really want to be remembered as somebody that um, helped others to achieve their dreams and goals 
and uh, and um, have and increase their personal confidence and belief and go out and make great products and services. Just today, I'm working on some, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm working on a real hairy problem in a company before this podcast started, but the company's product has the potential to change the world in a major, major way. It's a biotech company. We're going to fix it and it's going to really change the world, this company, and we're committed to that. And that's the kind of thing I like to dig my heels into and I like to be a part of that. So I just want to be remembered as somebody who helped entrepreneurs bring out great products and services and all stakeholders felt good accomplishment and rewards from it. Yeah. And, and same for me, you know, being someone who can provide true value, because I feel like there, you know, nowadays there's a lot of, you know, business uh, and mentors and, you know, this or that, that claim to do X, Y, and Z for you. But, you know, it's really just about, oh, pay me this or pay me that. And, you know, they don't really give that much value. I'd like to be looked at as someone that, you know, Tyler can actually provide value and be valuable and, you know, help other people to, again, yeah, achieve their successes and achieve their wins and get their and meet their goals. But like on a really true side by side in the trenches, like work mentality and 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 just really be valuable, like a valuable help to entrepreneurs, because I can look back on my career and say, OK, I can I have vivid memories of where I was and what I was doing when I was you know, given a hand or helped in some way, shape or form in a pivoting moment in my career. And I want to be now that for other people. Does that make sense? So. Absolutely. Well, John and Tyler, it was a huge pleasure to have you on the Establishing Your Empire show. It was a real fun uh, episode. I think we got a ton of advice, especially if you're wanting to start something. This is definitely the episode to listen to. Well, thank you so much for having us and keep up your great work because entrepreneurship is important and it's important to this country and our future. So thank you. Absolutely. And Tyler, next time I'm in Utah, we're going to have to uh, do a little one-on-one on on the pickleball court. Oh, that's a, that's a hundred percent. Yes.